Um, well, it was, it was Chris Schmidt's thesis, essentially, ten, eight or nine years ago. Chris, Chris Schmidt, who later did and still is doing remarkable stuff in strong interaction physics. He's Chris uh, Dolan, Horn, and Schmidt on uh, duality. Yeah. That's Schmidt. Actually, his thesis was investigating and showing that even when the bumps were in the physical region, they did not contribute to the total cross-section. They just rearranged the points in the Dallas plot. This was hmm? He didn't do it by these methods. <laughs> he wrote down a unitarity for three-particle production and <laughs> used dispersion relations. I mean, it was, a, it was an elaborate computation. Before we begin calling for any questions, I should say that there was an unconventional definition of G in the derivation of the forward dispersion relations last time. If you define things in the conventional way, so oh, okay, L prime is no, minus G M bar I gamma five tau, then uh, G pi plus or minus Pn equals root 2 g, not g as I wrote it last time. And therefore, with conventionally defined g's, the g squared should be replaced by 2 g squared. That's just a matter of definition, but I think at a later date, either in one of these lectures or in a um, <clears throat> in a homework problem, I will uh, use that dispersion relation with the conventional definition of G. So I tell you now, I made an error, I, or I used adopted an unconventional convention for the Pluton constant. Steve, take those. Are there questions about the last lecture? Yeah, I said the phase shift below the line was the phase shift above the was minus the phase shift above the line. Why was that? Why was that? Because yeah, that was proportional to proportional to means things that are free of singularities and real on the real axis. Root P, E the I delta, sine delta. Therefore, A Elementary algebra and the fact that with p changes sign as you go from above the cut to below the cut. This is also a cut in with p. Okay. Just the with p that makes the difference. Now, are there questions on the last lecture? Okay. I've got other questions, and I immediately turn to the board. Was there someone whose hand was up? <laughs> last lecture, we studied the properties of the partial wave S matrix, which I will now just call S. 
It is in general an n by n matrix. As a function of s, it has all sorts of singularities in the left-hand plane, which may be very exotic, by the way, if the masses are very different. And we're looking at an extremely inelastic two-body process, but I don't care about that. It has the singularities in the physical region, all the thresholds as the various channels open up, three body point here. And last lecture we showed we could analytically continue into the second sheet, indicated by that dotted thing that disk is slipped through the cut. And uh, in the second sheet, we might find singularities, but the only singularities we can find are poles. Perhaps single poles or perhaps multiple poles, but certainly no branch points, no essential singularities, etc. Therefore, we wish to consider a region of analyticity, which I'll now carve out of the two sheets and draw as a circle. And this is just an axis. It's not a point where anything strange happens, where the function looks like this. Uh, what we use for a variable in this region of analyticity is completely a matter of taste. We could use s, or we could use any function of s that is analytic, an analytic function of s in that disk. To agree with uh, non-relativistic conventions in some of our earlier work, I will use e as the variable the square root of s, that of course has a singularity, but it's way out here at s equals 0, no interest for r. s of v is analytic in this disk. Except for possible poles. imaginary part of E is less than 0. And we, of course, on the real axis, we now no longer have to say plus I epsilon or minus I epsilon because there is no singularity except the poles in the disk. S of E inverse equals S adjoint of E for E real. And extending it to complex E in the usual way, we obtain S inverse of E equals S adjoint of E star. What I will do is systematically study the consequences of these two equations to find a parameterization for the S matrix throughout this disk, and in particular, in this region of the real axis, which is presumed, I'll finish the sentence and I'll answer your question, which is presumed, I remind you, to be small compared to the characteristic range of variation of the S matrix, the pi on mass or the nucleon mass or whatever in the problem, and which therefore we can use our rule of thumb, and once we have an analytic function approximated by a constant. Yes, Kay, you have a question. You said it was the number of open channels. For example, if I'm doing pi nucleon scattering, the channels might be uh, a charge zero with charge plus one, pi, there'll be two channels, pi plus n, and uh, pi naught p and it'll be a two by two matrix. Of course, that's a rather trivial example because if we assume isospin invariance, we can uh, uh, block diagonalize uh, uh, the thing in uh, isospin eigenstates. But uh, for example, it doesn't have to be a relativistic problem. It could be scattering of an uh, electron off an atom, in which case there would be a host of channels corresponding to the various excited states of the atom. The electron could scatter elastically or it could still scatter in an essentially two-body way if the energy is below the ionization threshold of the atom into electron plus atom in its first excited state, electron plus atom in its second excited state, etc. We could still break things down according to the total center of mass momentum, and we'd have all of these two-body fixed J or fixed L states of a given energy that could communicate. Okay, is that is that clear? Yeah. Okay. The um, now uh, the uh, discussion will systematically go from the simplest possible case to the most general possible case. So I will begin by assuming. Only one channel is open, 
So it could be pi nucleons scattering in a fixed isospin state. So I can write S as e to the 2i delta, where delta, uh, remind, I remind you, I'm systematically suppressing the total angular momentum, which is being kept fixed, L. And one simple pole. For a complex energy, E, well, it's supposed to be somewhere in our region. It's got to have a real part. It's got to have an imaginary part, which is negative, since the only poles are in the lower half plane. And therefore, this is E1 minus I gamma 1 over 2, where gamma 1 is some positive number, and the 1 half is put in just to agree with conventions. Now, our game is as follows. We can firstly write the S matrix in our disk. Uh, whoops, that's a bad way of calling, saying this thing. So let me call this point Z1, some point in the complex plane. where B is the residue at the pole. A of E is now analytic in the region of interest within the disk, and by a rule of thumb, we will replace it by a constant, since it is an analytic function in some region supposed to be small. I wish I knew the etymology of that phrase. I should have looked it up. I've got a big dictionary. Why is a rough and ready rule called the rule of thumb? I don't know. With your thumb. Yeah, that might be a good idea. Except my thumb is more like two and a quarter inches. Well, 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 three. <laughs> That's right. They were undernourished in the Middle Ages. <laughs> because we've already shown that the function is analytic in the cut plane. And the upper half part of our disk extends into our original cut plane. Also, tens and zeros in the upper half plane will probably be the poles of the lower half plane. But only poles, nothing worse. Now, we have now exploited analyticity and our rule of thumb. The only thing left is the to exploit is to be up here. Uh, in order to exploit that, I'll factor out the constant and write this as A, which is now a constant, times 1 plus B over A, E minus Z1. Or, rationalizing the denominator and rearranging terms, A times E minus C, some other numerical constant, defined in terms of E minus Z over A, E minus Z1. Now I'll use the equation, which is true in the entire disk. The upper half is in the upper half plane, the lower half in the lower half plane. S of E, S star of E star, is 1 by 1, so adjoint is star, equals 1. Equals, I can now compute, A, A star, dragging that out, E minus C, over E minus Z1, <coughs> E minus C star, over E minus Z1 star. That's the complex conjugate expression evaluated the complex conjugate argument. The stars get canceled out of the E's, but remain in the other parameters. Now, in particular, one is totally free of poles, and therefore, the residue of the pole at z equals z1, at e equals z1, must vanish. Um, the only um, way that can happen is if uh, one of these two factors in the numerator, since we've got the numerator already in perfect factorized form, cancels the zero in the denominator. Therefore, either to cancel the pole, either c equals z1 or c star equals z1. 
C equals E1 is certainly a logical possibility, but then we wouldn't have any pole in the first place. Our original S matrix would just be a constant. Therefore, we must choose C Two terms in square brackets now cancel each other completely, and we are left with 1 equals AA star, which we summarize by saying A is e to the 2i, a quantity I'll call delta B, a constant. Delta B is called the background. or sometimes the non-resonant part. of the phase shift. Background does not mean background in the usual sense of experimental physics. Background is junk. Background simply means it is what the phase shift becomes as E gets far away from Z as we see from this formula, where the square bracket here becomes 1. Of course, not too far away, or we may be out of the region where a rule of thumb is applicable. And the expression doesn't hold. Thus, we have a parameterization of the S matrix in terms of the background phase shift and the location of the pole. written in a form that is more, perhaps more familiar to you, by derationalizing the uh, a fraction, 1 minus i gamma 1, e minus e1, Are there any questions about these algebraic steps? They should impress you with their clarity and simplicity. Now, let's look at some simple cases. Delta background equals 0. In this case, S minus 1, which I remind you is 2i e to the i delta sine delta, is minus i gamma 1 over e minus e1. I know it's blazing hot in here. Is there a functioning air conditioning in this room? Does anyone know? Well, let's see. Occupied, that button is pushed. That object is sealed, and that object is sealed. Once again, once again, buildings and grounds have done its work. <laughs> well, one never knows with this crowd. <laughs> so, the, uh, Uh, thus, um, this is, of course, the familiar Bright-Wigner formula. Uh, it's uh, precisely what we would have obtained when we did a model in which we had a, a meson coupled to two other mesons, so it could decay. And there was no interaction in the world aside from that weak decay coupling constant, so that in particular, there was no background phase shift. It, of course, leads to a phase shift that goes from 0 to pi, increasing. Famous right figure formula, trivial. And the total cross-section, which aside from kinematic factors, which are effectively constants over this region. Yes, sir? Yeah, I wasn't sure what the argument was why delta background was zero. No, I'm not. Special case. No, no, but I mean, uh, 
Well, case, the special case was a pure scalar theory in which the only term in the Lagrangian was g phi psi star psi. And g was considered small. The phi particle made a, made a resonance pull in uh, phi psi psi scattering. Okay. And, uh, but there was no other psi psi interaction. So there was no phase, there was no appreciable uh, scattering amplitude away from the resonance pull. If we were to consider a case where we had this kind of interaction, and we were to sum up in some approximation psi psi scattering without assuming lambda was small, then we would get an example with the background phase shift. The background phase shift, and this thing still weakly coupled, so the pole would stay close to the real axis. Okay, and the cross terms between this and this would give us, well, we'll see the sort of interference terms you can get. Okay, I'm going to give you that as a homework problem next lecture in a, in a uh, implausible but analytically tractable approximation. Um, the, um, now, um, sigma is proportional, of course, to sine squared delta, aside from kinematic factors. That is to say, the contributions of the cross-section from this particular partial wave and is therefore proportional to gamma 1 squared over e minus e minus e1 squared plus 1 quarter gamma 1 squared. This again, I presume, is familiar to you. I lectured on it last time. It's the famous bright Wigner peak sine squared delta goes to its maximum possible value at the center of the peak, one, when the phase shift passes through pi over two, and the full width at half maximum is gamma. We can also see what happens if delta a more complicated case than one we looked at before, in which um, for example, just to get an idea of another special case, delta background is pi over 4. As we see from this formula, which is perhaps the easiest way to look at it, the total phase shift is just the sum of the bright Wigner phase shift plus the background phase shift. So we start out with the background phase shift. Of course, I put the 0 at E equals E1. The, we put the back background phase shift gives us, if this is 1, 1 half all the way away from the pole. Then as we get close to the pole, as we tra traverse the real axis, we begin adding in the bright Wigner phase shift, which goes from 0 to pi. So this thing does something like this. It goes up to 90 degrees early. And then at the halfway point, it's back to 3 pi over 4, which has the same sine squared. And it goes uh, down again, goes through zero here, and goes out like this. This is strong interference between a uh, non-resonant background and the uh, resonance scattering amplitude. Or equivalent, or for a super strong interference, we can look at the extreme case. Delta background is pi over is uh, pi over two. That is to say, it's already scattering as much as it possibly can in this particular partial wave before you get near the pole. And in that case, a corresponding graph, badly drawn, but would lead to uh, exactly uh, upside down, to a carved out bright Wigner peak. Because when you reach the center of the bright Wigner peak, you're adding pi over 2 to the pi over 2, which gives you pi, whose sine squared is 0. Are these drawings clear? All of these are possibilities as far as our zoology, as far as uh, this analysis goes. They, of course, agree with our previous analysis in the case when this analysis here, in the case when we would expect them to overlap. But they're more general in that they allow for the possibility of uh, non-resonant background scattering. And um, they are not tied uh, to particular dynamics. They do not assume that this pole is being made by some fundamental field in the theory which is weakly coupled to some decay channels and therefore decays. 
this pole could be there for some other reason altogether. It could be a future, something that would become a bound state if the coupling constant were sufficiently strong, but it isn't. So the thing just is lurking there on the second sheet waiting for you to turn up the coupling constant so it can emerge on the first sheet and become a, a bound state. This could be the n star resonance, for example, in pi n scattering. Are there any questions whatsoever? On the other hand, as I said at the end of last lecture, in another sense, this is less general in our perturbative analysis because it is definitely, the whole analysis is definitely tied to the fact that we are below three body threshold or that the coupling to three body channels are weak. So we can ignore the uh, uh, two body to three body matrix elements of the S matrix. And our field theoretic analysis doesn't depend on whether it's a two particle intermediate state or a three particle intermediate state that shoves the pole and the propagator onto the second sheet. Now, I will now go on to the next most general case, which is still one channel, but many poles. We could arrange this in a field theoretic model, rather like the model I've alluded to here, by having several phi fields, which all couple to psi star psi, and we fudge the parameters in the theory so that all of their masses are roughly the same. We choose the bare masses that way. simple or multiple. I will write down the explicit formula in the case of simple poles, but we will be able to consider multiple poles trivially by making several simple poles coincide. Thus, as before, I have a constant by the rule of thumb. Thumb on however many poles there are. Of um, the, um, you think we get more cross ventilation, although somewhat more noise, if I open this door? I know, but if it moves, it will uh, evaporate. Except I can't think. <laughs> that's uh, the cooling system that's built into human beings. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't make this. <laughs> ah, brilliant, brilliant suggestion, Roy. Except this device should do something. <laughs> you want me to leave the door closed? <laughs> No, the, um, the, uh, we can, of course, divide out A and rationalize the denominator as before, multiply all the factors together, and obtain product on I, C, Z minus CI, Z minus ZI, where CIs are unknown constants. This is just as general, and of course, as now in this form is also good if you had multiple poles. That just means some of given z's would be counted more than once. We now have the unitarity equation. Z. I should have called it E. You should have. A 
Again, the only possibility for canceling the poles is that ci equals the i star, or some permutation thereof. But since there's no particular assignment of the ci's to the individual z's in this formula, we might as well choose them by convention to be ci star. To cancel the poles, that would otherwise arise at E equals ZI. Again, we obtain A is to either 2I delta background. So in terms of the S matrix, our parameterization for the S matrix is very simple. It is simply a product of individual bright Wigners. The multiple pole case is no more complicated than the single pole case. Notice this is a terrible expression in terms of the scattering amplitude. If we were to write things out in terms of S minus 1, we wouldn't have a simple product formula at all. We'd have all sorts of god-awful things where we have one resonance going by and the other resonance going by and the two resonances interfering with each other when we first have make one resonance and then make another. But it has a very simple two-particle unitarity make, gives, tells us an enormous constraint upon the possible interference terms between the different resonance poles. Essentially, when you have many resonances, you have uh, no new freedom. In this case, when you have many poles, many unstable particles, all of the interference terms in the expression for the S matrix, all the relative phases of all of the resonance poles are completely determined once you give the locations of the individual poles and the background phase shift. Okay, that's a very, very strong result. You can get peculiar patterns this way. I must say they are more frequently found in nuclear physics when one has, or atomic physics, when one has many close together unstable states with the same value of the angular momentum than in high energy physics where unstable states or indeed any kind of states tend to be rather widely spaced. But just to give an example of the sort of graph you can get, I'll just pick an example. It makes a pretty picture I can draw. Delta background equals zero. And I'll assume I have two poles that have the same location on the real axis, but one of them is much farther from the real axis than the other. One of them has a large imaginary part, and the other has a small imaginary part. So as this would be two resonances with roughly the same energy, but one of them much larger width than the other, two unstable states. So I go along, E is zero. I begin to see the phase shift from the broad resonance, which starts out much earlier, so it starts rising up like this. I get to the point where I see this pole here, at this, this region here, it's a narrow resonance. Therefore, adding to, added to my old backward bright Wigner phase shift is a new bright Wigner phase shift that wants to go very rapidly through 180 degrees. That is to say, the broad resonance acts as background for the narrow resonance. So the thing turns around and goes through that and then settles down again. So we can get all sorts of peculiar patterns like this, a little upside down bright Wigner stuck in the middle of a big fat bright Wigner shape. Any questions? I now want to turn to the many-channel case. I will do explicitly the case with many channels as a, and a single simple pole. And then because we're all getting bored with this, I will stop and just tell you what the answer is when there are many channels and many poles. short circuit some of the analysis 
S is now a matrix. I'll factor out a background S matrix. Since I, we all know the constant term is going to be a background S matrix. Then there'll be a leftover part that I will write in a somewhat peculiar way, inspired by the single channel formula. Where Z1 is defined as before, and P is some matrix, the residue at the pole. Certainly I can write it in that way. It's each of the N entries has a pole. I'll write it as a constant plus a residue of the pole, and I'll factor out the constant, which is obviously the background S matrix, and by itself, obviously unitary. because it's what the S matrix becomes when E is far from Z1. P at the moment is a totally unknown matrix. Okay. This is merely a matter of arbitrary choice that I factored the background S matrix out on the right left. I could have just as well factored it out on the right, which would of course lead to a different definition of P. Or I could have factored it out if I were interested in symmetry of the S matrix, the consequences of time reversal invariance. It might be best to factor out the square root of the background S matrix on the left and the square root of the background S matrix on the right. But I'll work out the consequences for this factorization, and you can shift things around if you want to. Now, now we have a matrix formula to explore. S of E adjoint S of E equals 1. The background S matrix. Thank you. Oh, whoops, S of, do it this way. The background S matrix, of course, factors out between the two factors. And I have 1 minus I plus I, gamma 1, P adjoint, E minus Z1 star, 1, sorry, 1 minus I gamma. 1p e minus z1. Now, once again, I argue the residue at the poles must vanish. And in particular, if I look at the poles at, um, Z equals Z1, for example, or E equals Z1, I should say. From um, the right-hand factor, I have a residue minus I gamma 1 P. From the left-hand factor, I have 1. Z equals Z1. Z1 minus Z1 star is minus I gamma 1. You are going to turn on the air conditioning, sir? <laughs> and they get ten dollars an hour, union scale. <laughs> the uh, E Z equals Z one, we get minus I gamma one in the denominator, so I get here one minus P. Adjoint. The minus I gamma 1 is a numerical factor which I might as well cancel out. And therefore I have the equation P equals P adjoint P that the residue at the pole must cancel. Taking the adjoint of this equation, I obtain P adjoint equals P adjoint P which by the previous equation is P. So P is a Hermitian matrix. And indeed, it is a projection matrix, which is why I called it P, cunning fellow that I am, since P equals P squared. <laughs> that is to say, it is a Hermitian matrix with eigenvalues plus 1 and 0 only. Any questions? Any Hermitian matrix can be written in terms of its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Therefore, we have P equals sum R over 1 to some number capital R. 
less than or equal to n, the non-zero eigenvalues of some eigenvector er times this adjoint, er adjoint. That is the expression for the matrix in terms of eigenvectors and eigenvalues, where er adjoint es equals delta rs. They're unit orthogonal vectors, as the eigenvectors of any Hermitian matrix are. On this level, aside from the fact that they're orthogonal and unit, they are totally arbitrary. There could be one of them or there could be n of them. Depends on the detailed dynamics of the problem. Let us, for the moment, restrict ourselves to the simplest case. which is a projection matrix of rank 1 and no background scattering. I will then work out more general cases. I then have S equals 1 minus I gamma 1 E 1 E 1 adjoint uh, E minus E 1 plus I gamma 1 over 2. This corresponds to what we'd expect resonance scattering to be like in a multi-channel case. If I take E super I to be the unit vectors for the various channels, that is pi n, uh, pi plus n, pi naught p, et cetera, the various two-body channels, the original basis vectors, okay, then <clears throat> S minus 1 from channel I to channel J, the is minus I gamma 1, EI adjoint E1. I shouldn't use the same, I didn't. E super I, that's the unit basis vector. This is the unique eigenvector of the matrix. E1 adjoint EJ over E minus E1 plus I gamma 1 over 2. This is what we imagine to get from scattering of a unstable particle from a, uh, that can couple to various channels with various coupling constants. Indeed, if we define GI equals E1 adjoint EI, this is something like Go ahead, Bob. minus I go star GI over a typical unstable particle or resonance denominator. We're not here where no one can see it, but it's the same denominator as is in the previous equation. This is exactly what we'd expect to get from a Feynman graph, where here are two particles in channel I. They have some coupling constant, GI. They make a resonance, which gives us a characteristic resonance pole. It decays with some coupling constant, GJ, into channel J. Well, no, with some coupling constant, GJ st adjoint, or star, that's presumably some reflection of TCP or something like that, that the amplitude for decay is the conjugate of the amplitude for production <laughs> of time reversal or something. I don't know. Anyway, that's how it comes out, the way we factored it. Okay, this is exactly the combinatoric structure we would get from a Feynman diagram. Of course, the multiplicative factors in front are not those we would get from a Feynman diagram because we're looking at an S matrix, partial wave S matrix element rather than an invariant amplitude. 
So there are all sorts of phase-based factors stuck into the definition of S minus 1. We also see the total decay width because from the definition of these things and the fact that E1 is a unit matrix, gamma 1 is sum on I, GI squared, which is, of course, just our old statement that you get the total width by squaring the amplitudes for decay into all those channels into which the particle can decay and summing over them. In our old formula, there were all sorts of phase-based factors, but here we've absorbed them into the definition of the GIs. Okay? <clears throat> what if there's background? Well, if there's background, but still only a single decay channel, S minus 1 is the background thing. Well, it was S background minus 1 from the constant term plus S background times minus I gamma 1, E1, E1 adjoint over E minus C1. By elementary algebra, you just multiply the thing on the left. And we can interpret that by saying that S minus 1, graphically, is firstly, of course, there's got to be the scattering that would be there. This is channel J. This is channel I. That would be there if there weren't any resonance at all. That's what happens when you go far from the resonance. And then there's the resonance pole contribution, which in this way of looking at things has the following peculiar form. Here's GI, defined just as before. The resonance can go along and decay into channel K. And then I have, this is in the Feynman graph loop, this is just a sum over intermediate states I'm trying to represent graphically. The background scattering that can go into channel I. That is to say, the resonance behaves as if it is a, uh, as if there were no background scattering. And then when you compute the final state, you've got to multiply it by the background S matrix to reshuffle the final particles. Of course, it's totally a matter of convention that the background S matrix in this formula, this is the so-called final state interaction theorem, that the background S matrix appears in this channel, in this uh, problem, all on the right, on the left, I'm sorry. If I had done a different factorization to begin with, I would have, putting the background S matrix on the right, I would have had a redefinition of the E's and therefore the G's, and I would get a formula where it looks like they scatter before they make the resonance, not after. Or if I factored things so the square root of the S matrix was on the right and the square root of the S matrix was on the left, they would do half their scattering before they made their resonance and half their scattering after they made the resonance. That's purely a matter of convention. What is not a matter of convention and which is the critical physical fact is that the background S matrix appears here only once, not twice. It's not what you would might naively think that first they scatter, then they make the resonance, and then they do all their scattering again. It doesn't involve S background squared. formula, which is obviously physically interpretable as the exchange of, or the formation and decay of R degenerate resonances, all of which happen to have the same mass and the same width. So you just have a sum of terms of this form in the second place in this graphical equation. Totally degenerate, same mass, same width. 
we're just summing over a bunch of terms. This would, might be what happens. It says particles there behind the door. This might be what happens, are degenerate unstable particles. This might be what happens, for example, if I consider closing my eyes to charge conjugation and isospin invariance, for example, the J equals 3 halves parity plus channel for pi and nucleon scattering, where I have four n stars, all of which have the same mass and the same width. It's a typical situation that would arise when one has an internal symmetry. Are there questions about this? Because the E's are orthogonal, I can write this in another way that gives us a clue to the appropriate guess to make. When there are many things, many multiple poles, 1 minus I gamma 1, ER, ER adjoint, Z minus Z1. Uh, the cross terms that would appear in the product and keep it from being a sum vanish because ER adjoint ES equals 0. R not equal to S. So all the cross terms involving two pairs of E's disappear. It is the same expression as before. Is that clear to everyone that it is the same expression? I'm not sure if your wilted expressions are due to my lecture or the heat or a combined effect of the two. <laughs> now, this enables us to make a guess about what happens when there are many poles, some of which may be multiple poles. It's obviously just a product again. Product and I, which may run over a huge set if there are 42 poles in the second sheet, some of which are poles of rank 31 or something like that. <laughs> 1 minus I gamma 1 EI, some unit vector, EI adjoint, gamma I, E minus ZI. This certainly obeys all of our analyticity constraints, since it's a product of S matrix, all of which are each of which is meromorphic, except in the lower half plane. It certainly obeys our unitarity constraints. It's unitary, unitary along the real axis, which <coughs> because it's a product of matrices that are unitary along the real axis, and a product of unitary matrices is a unitary matrix. So certainly the general answer will be at least this general. I don't know why I put a curly bracket on one side and a square bracket on the other. The general answer will be at least this general. What one has to show is that this is the most general answer, which I will not bother to do in these lectures because it's a tedious and unenlightening argument involving matrix manipulation. Gamma I, ZI, EI, EI adjoint. Just a product of one channel. Is the imaginary part of ZI times two, times minus two. If ZI is EI. If ZI is a completely free real number. I just multiply them together. I mean, that was or turned out to be the right answer in the single channel case. Why shouldn't it be the right answer in the multiple channel case? It certainly satisfies all of our constraints. From this, one can work out all sorts of beautiful graphs for what happens in the multiple channel case when there are two resonances close to each other, when there's one resonance and a lot of background, when there's one resonance and, uh, and uh, many, uh, and uh, no back, uh, and a uh, little background and so on, but I'll leave those things as exercises for you. If you want to, I mean, the zoology becomes much more complicated. And in general, the form is much more, much less constrained, although it is constrained, than the uh, single channel case. Because as you see, if I have different resonances at different locations, these EIs, as far as I know, the, appropriate, the associated E's, can point in completely different directions in the n-dimensional vector space, or be a little, or be aligned, or be, have a small inner product or a large inner product. 
And the amount of interference in any particular channel I get between the two resonances depends on whether their inner product is large or small. When I only had one channel, of course, the associated ease had to point in the same direction. That's a degenerate case of this because there was only one vector in this vector space. And they all had to be proportional to it, so I was guaranteed to get total interference. I was guaranteed to get a dip, for example, when I had the going all the way down to zero, when I had those two resonances on top of each other. In this case, I could get a full dip, or I could get a partial dip, or I could get no dip at all, depending on whether the E's are aligned or orthogonal or something in between. Is this clear to everyone, or do you want me to work out particular cases? Now, this concludes our applications of analyticity properties without using any other physics. I've given two examples. One is a dispersion relation, last lecture, uh, deriving the forward dispersion relation for pi on nucleon scattering, where we could get an equation, an exact equation that could be tested experimentally. This is a quite different example where we have used analyticity properties to get ideas about the rates of variations of functions and obtain what we expect to be uh, certainly approximate formulas because we assume that the analytic part is a constant, but we would expect to be very good approximate formulas that tell us how we would expect the S matrix to wiggle. The gross features in the S matrix, the bumps in partial wave cross sections that we would expect to appear in a region far above two body thresholds and far below three body thresholds. That's a restricted region and it's only an approximate formula, but still we have obtained powerful results. We've seen the only things we can get are essentially bright Wigner S matrices or multiple products of bright Wigner S matrices. Are there questions on anything I have done? Is it hard to draw something that obviously doesn't look like a bunch of bright Wigner? Sure. I mean, if I, uh, if I took the conjugate of this expression, that would be wrong. It would have a pole in the upper half plane. The phase shift would go rapidly through pi over 2 going down rather than going up. <laughs> no one, I mean, you wouldn't see it in the total cross section, but if you actually measure the phase shift, as people do in phase shift analysis, it would strike you. Okay. Even in the most general multi-channel case, where if I only have access to a particular matrix element, okay, the constraints of unitarity are, are useless. All I know is that I have a pole with some residue that may be real or may be complex. If I look at a random matrix element of this expression when there is background around, I don't know too much about what's going on. But I do know that the S matrix element Let's say this is a plot of Sij in the complex plane. No, this is a plot of Sij, a complex number for real E, a so-called argon plot. I know from this thing, or I should say Sij minus delta Ij. So all I really know if I look at a particular matrix element is that I've got a pole. But I know it's a pole in the lower half plane. So I know I plot this thing, this is E, parameterizing this curve. It wanders around the complex plane. It's got to go through a circle, I guess, like this. Whoops, no, exactly the other way around. It's going to make some sort of little tight circle, because that's what happens to this thing. Okay, it starts out from some background value, and it goes around the little circle. And I know. Um, it's got to go around the circle this way. And I know the rate at which it goes around the circle as a function of energy, parameterized in terms of the width. And if you actually look at the open up your data booklets and uh, look at the argon plots for pi nucleon scattering, where partial wave cross section, par the individual partial wave amplitudes have been measured, uh, you'll find this thing sort of wanders around in the complex plane doing anything it wants to. And then every once in a while, there's a, a little wiggle, like that. It goes zippity zip. But it always goes around the circle clockwise, it uh, counterclockwise. It never goes around the circle clockwise. 
Okay, and that's the statement that all the poles are in the lower half plane. <laughs> and the only thing you've got in the lower half plane are poles. Never makes a square, you know, or goes part way around, turns around. <laughs> yeah, it just it always is a superimposed on it. It's a little circle. <laughs> I'd now like to begin a completely new topic to musical accompaniment, <laughs> which some people are disturbed because it's also a topic being covered by Alvaro in his course, but I think there's a sufficient or insufficient overlap between the two courses. And also, what? Oh, you heard his treatment. Wait until you <laughs> Our treatments may be, um, may be a bit different. And the subject I am going to talk about goes under the general rubric of current algebra, general name of current algebra, although in fact the algebra will not emerge until the next lecture. I don't promise that my convention will agree with anyone else's. But uh, that's just a question of square roots of twos and minus signs. I want to teach you the techniques. I'll try and keep my conventions uh, um, um, uh, uh, consistent within these lectures, although not necessarily consistent with every, anything else. <laughs> uh, in order to explain the subject, I will have to begin by giving a lightning summary of the weak interactions, not the weak interactions as we know them now with CP violation and uh, neutral currents and uh, uh, renormalizable spontaneously broken gauge theories of the weak interaction and electromagnetic interactions and all of that. But the weak interactions as they were in my childhood, that is to say, <laughs> the low energy phenomenology of the Fermi theory as improved by Feynman and Gelman. So I'll give a summary of the weak interactions. Circa mid-60s. That's still a pretty good theory for practically all weak interact all low energy weak interaction processes below a few BEV. Nobody has seen an intermediate vector boson yet. And uh, we'll stick with that theory. Uh, the in form of the interaction that's responsible for the weak interactions, the interaction Lagrangian, is a universal constant that governs the strength of all weak interactions called the Fermi constant, divided by the square root of 2 by conventions, J lambda, J lambda adjoint, where J lambda is some vector field. What it is, we don't know. I'm not going to tell you yet and uh, made up of all the part, in some way, of all the fields that describe all the particles in the world. Um, it is, uh, if you would, I'll tell you this lectonic part, and then I'll, you'll have, nobody really knows this hadronic part, because we don't know whether hadrons are fundamental mesons and baryons, or whether they're quarks, or whatever. And if we don't know what fields are in there, we don't know what fields we make J lambda out of. G is a constant that's weak on a normal scale. It's approximately 10 to the minus fifth times the mass of the proton to minus two. Uh, this is, of course, a dimensionful coupling constant. It has to be a, the integral over all space of a current, if it's conventionally normalized, the charge, which is dimensionless. So a current has dimensions of L to the minus three, or m cubed. This is an interaction with dimensions of m sixth. It is, of course, non-renormalizable, therefore. And that was one of the great problems with weak interaction theories in the mid-60s. You had a theory that which enabled you to uh, compute everything at low energies with dazzling accuracy whenever you could do a computation. But whenever you try to compute higher order corrections, you got divergences and infinities that could not be absorbed into a renormalization. It was disgusting that the weak interactions were so weak. As we said then, if the weak interactions were a little, little bit stronger, we could see the second order effects easily in, or in doable experiments, and then we get some idea of what's going on. But we couldn't, and we had to rely upon a genius to figure out what was going on. 
and we think it came through, but we still aren't sure because the second order effects are still hard to measure. J lambda is a sum of a hadronic part and a leptonic part. And both of these, this theory is charge conserving, carry delta Q equals 1. This is a positively charged current, one that creates positively charged particles when acting on the vacuum. Uh, also, by the way, the whole thing is set up so that the whole interaction is CP conserving. This does not include the small CP violating effects observed in neutral K on decays. Now I'll tell you something that makes this equation make sense because it tells you what the scale of J is by giving you the scale of the leptonic part, a notation in which the names of particles stand for the four-dimensional Dirac spin, four-component Dirac spinners associated with them. This is nu bar E, gamma lambda, one minus gamma five, E, the electron field, plus a corresponding thing with an electron field replaced by a muon field and an electron neutrino replaced by a muon neutrino. About the hadronic part, I will tell you nothing except it is built up only of hadronic fields. I will give you more information about it as we fill up these blackboards. Uh, Bjorkin and Drell. It may be it's on the other side of the gamma lambda. I copied this from... Uh, I copied this from uh, Adler's book, who say they use the Bjorken and Drell convention. So gamma, five is gamma 5 is Hermitian, it's plus 1, minus 1. It's a, from that, you cannot tell whether it's gamma 5 or minus gamma 5. Okay. They say with the Bjorken and Drell, gamma 5 is this. I didn't actually work out the polarization and muon decay to make sure they were right. This thing may be riddled with, these lectures, I warn you, may be riddled with minus sign errors. Okay. Don't trust me. Trust me on the coefficients in front. If I, there's a minus sign in the game someplace, I may have made a mistake or I may be using a different gamma 5 convention than I think I'm using. Since I didn't want to work out the whole thing from first principles, <clears throat> I took it from books and I may have misunderstood their conventions. The, um, this has charge plus 1. Yes, it annihilates an electron, which is a negatively charged particle. We see from this form of the interaction that there are two kinds, three kinds of interactions that can be um, dealt with by this thing. One are purely leptonic interactions that come from lepton-lepton cross terms, such as muon decay, or high neutrino scattering off electrons to make muons, but certain muon decay. And because, in fact, of muon decay, we know that this is the proper form here. It fits muon decay. Muon decay is a beautiful process. It proceeds through weak interactions, so lowest order perturbation theory should be absolutely reliable. The particles have no interactions worth worrying about aside from the weak interactions. Electromagnetism is there, but does not make important corrections to muon decay. And when it does make corrections, they're computable, since you understand everything about electromagnetism. So from studying the experiments in muon decay and doing enough experiments, you can essentially read off the Lagrangian, and this is the Lagrangian you read off. We can also have hadron-hadron parts, which give us pure hadronic weak interactions, such as lambda goes into proton plus pi. And for that, the evidence for the current-current form of the interaction is zip, since we know nothing about the strong interactions, and the strong interactions would infiltrate the process in complicated ways, making it essentially impossible to read off what the interaction is. So the, this part, the hadron-hadron part, is just symmetry and guesswork that make, made people say in the mid-60s that was the form. The more interesting things are so-called semi-leptonic decays, where a hadron, call it H, goes into another hadron, or possibly into the vacuum, but anyway, some strongly interacting state H prime, plus leptons, some leptonic state, a pair of leptons, of course. The, um, 
matrix element one has to study to govern this process is H prime L J lambda hadron um, J lambda hadron J lambda adjoint lepton H. Assuming, of course, that the leptons produced are negatively charged. If they're positively charged, we study the complex conjugate of this object. This factors because leptons and hadrons don't interact, ignoring electromagnetism aside from the weak interaction. So we simply get H prime J lambda hadron H leptons J upper lambda leptonic, which we know adjoint vacuum. Ignoring E and M. Thus, the situation is rather that of for electrons, like electron scattering off a proton, where the matrix element again factors into a known part and a mysterious part. Here again, it factors. We know all the dependence on the leptonic. We know the entire matrix element in terms of a one hadron, say if it's a single hadron and this is a single hadron, matrix element of J lambda hadron. And thus, we can parameterize this process in terms of anal analogs of electromagnetic form factors, the weak interaction form factors. This is as big an improvement as the fact that for electron scattering off a proton, we know everything in terms of the proton form factors. Instead of functions of many kinematic variables, we have a function of one kinematic variable only, the momentum transferred to the current, presuming these are both one particle states, as they are in the typical case. In an atypical case, like pi on decay, where the pi plus goes into just leptons, things are even better. We have a matrix element of the current between a one pi and state in a vacuum, and instead of form factors, we just have a number, since there are no free kinematic variables. I will discuss these in more detail shortly. In any event, by studying these things, we know a lot about J lambda hadron. We know it is parity violating. This part by itself is parity violating. It's the sum of a vector current and an axial vector current, so there's no way of cooking up this interaction so that it's parity conserving. But there is parity violation in the hadronic part. Addition. I presume, by the way, that I'm telling you things you know in some vague way before you went into this room. And otherwise, this material is going at you much, much too fast. But I presume this stuff you know. J lambda is the sum of a vector part and an actual vector part. It's written as V minus A, at least in my conventions. V is a vector current under the parity defined by the strong interactions, and A is an axial vector current. <coughs> Both parts are um, as I say, charge conserving. Both parts are either don't change the hypercharge and change the isospin total iso obey the selection rules for delta i equals one. Does the positively charged component of an isovector pi plus like? I might say, that is to say, it has the isospin transformation properties of the pi plus state. Or a term which changes the hypercharge by plus one and changes the total isospin by one half. It's the famous delta i equals one half rule for semi-leptonic decays. And this is, as it were, k plus like. The current has the same transformation properties as the k plus state or the adjoint of the K plus field. The, why am I staring at information about resonance poles? Help, let me get this in the right order. Um, the, um, 
We know something more. We knew something more even in the late 50s about the vector part of this current with uh, delta y equals 0. This is the famous uh, CVC hypothesis. CVC stands for conserved current of Feynman and Gelman. If you look at V mu, delta i equals 0, uh, not delta i equals 0, delta y equals 0, strangeness changing. That is to say, just the part of V mu that doesn't change the strangeness, the part that contributes, for example, to nucleon beta decay, neutron goes or neutron beta decay. Uh, there was had been known for a long time that the vector part of that obeyed well, universality. The coupling constant seemed to be the same as uh, the coupling constant for muon decay. The matrix element of the vector current at small momentum transfers, and of course the proton is so close to the neutron that only small momentum transfers are relevant, seemed to be pretty close to 1 in the scale in which this, the normalizing everything so that this vector current has matrix element 1 between electron and neutrino. Now Feynman and Gelman said, um, This, um, this can't be a coincidence. How can it be? Even if we started out initially so the thing had matrix element 1, the strong interactions are going to infiltrate our computation of the matrix element and change things from 1 to 3 halves or from 1 to 1 half or something. How can it stay 1? Well, they had a, um, an idea. They said, there is one case and one case only we know in which the matrix element of a current at small momentum transfers is not affected by the strong interactions. That if it is if it is a conserved current. The example of this is electromagnetism, where F1 of 0 stays firmly fixed at 1. It has no strong interaction corrections. The proton has an anomalous magnetic moment, but it doesn't have an anomalous charge. Well, that argument didn't involve much of electromagnetic theory. In particular, it was true if we went to lowest order in electromagnetism and uh, all orders in the strong interactions, in which case there would be a parallelism between the electromagnetic current and any other conserved current. So they said, this current has got to be a positively charged conserved current. Now, they know of only one positively charged conserved current, the isos positively charged isospin current. So they said this thing was equal to the charge-raising isospin current. That was their hypothesis. In that way, they explained the so-called universality of the weak interactions, that the matrix element, the vector part of the matrix element for neutron beta decay was precisely 1. It was actually 1 within 1 or 2 percent, but they said that could be an electromagnetic vertex correction or something, something that is not a lowest order effect that involves not just JJ, but also electromagnetic effects. So they said, that was their guess. It was exactly that, not with any foul, p funny poly type terms, d mu, sigma mu, nu times something, but exactly that. They were making a bold guess. We certainly build lots of other conserved currents by adding divergences of anti-symmetric tensors. They said, we don't want to do that. That somehow makes the interaction too ugly. It's just going to be the isospin current. And then they had a check on their guess. Because they said, that's right. Then, because of the isospin invariance of the strong interactions, the form factors for this thing, F1 and F2, just like the form factors for the electromagnetic current, should be related completely to the form factors, just by an isospin rotation, to the form factors for the I sub Z current, which is part of the electromagnetic current, which we know by taking the difference between proton and neutron form factors. Now, measuring these weak interaction form factors is not easy. The easiest thing you can do is to measure the analog of F2 at 0, and even that is not easy. You have to look at a cunningly crafted nuclear beta decay so that the, the uh, F1 form factor can't play a role. It obeys the wrong selection rules, and only the F2 form factor can play a role. And then you've got to do a lot of nuclear physics to divide out the matrix elements. 
but then nuclear physics matrix elements, but then you end up with, in principle, a measurement of F2 at zero for this weak interaction current that should be related by an isospin rotation to F2 of zero, electromagnetic F2 of zero, difference between proton and neutron. This is so-called weak magnetism, and it works. You get the right answer. Again, this is not a course in the weak interactions. This is the abstract of a course in the weak interactions I'm giving, so I'm not going to give you the details. But is the general idea clear? This is, in principle, a testable hypothesis. It has been tested. It works. Am I going too fast? You know, ask questions. No. Okay. Although, um, we can go, um, we're not going to use it in our current algebra discussion, since we did devote a lot of time to talking about SU3. And since this is a lightning summary of the whole thing, I should tell you about what Kabibo did in 1962, which was fit the weak interactions together with SU3. He said, ha, Feynman and Gelman have told us that the isos the I equals one part, the strangeness preserving part of the vector current is a, uh, the isospin current. Now, we know the isospin current is part of an SU3 octet. It's one of the eight, isospin is one of the eight generators of SU3. We know that the, um, um, in exactly the same octet, there is another positively charged current. If this one is pi plus like, transforms like the pi plus, there's also the k plus. That's the only other positively charged object in an octet. There's pi plus and k plus, a bunch of neutral particles, pi minus and k minus. We also know this has exactly the same isospin and strangeness properties as the k plus. So therefore, if we label currents, SU3 octet currents, by the transformation properties of the appropriate mesons, so we have a vector current that transforms like the pi plus, the positively charged isospin current, and a vector current that transforms like the k plus, the positively charged strangeness changing current, Seems very natural to imagine that the total weak vector weak interaction current is simply the sum of these two things. After all, in the world of perfect SU3, who can tell the difference between a pi plus and a k plus? Indeed, Kabibo suggested that the combinations were weighted together in such a way that the sum of the squares of the coefficients were one. Theta is an angle called the Kabibo angle. He made this guess. He said, God really wanted to make things. Theta must be a very small angle so that this cosine theta will be one within a few percent to agree with what I told you earlier. So the thing Feynman and Gelman thought were electromagnetic corrections is really a, um, a electromagnetic corrections plus terms of order theta squared. But let that by for a moment. Kabibo's general idea was that God said, let there be weak interactions and let there be medium strong interactions that break SU3. And he. Um, he didn't look, he didn't peek, okay, to make sure they were in the same direction. If there were no weak interaction, electromag, medium strong interactions, you could make an SU3 rotation to turn this into a pure pi plus state and he posed without affecting electromagnetism. And then it would just be no strangeness changing at all by definition, since you can define strangeness as you wish if you have no SU3 violating interactions. It just happened, the directions didn't quite match. Cosine theta is a measure, the angle theta is a measure of the mismatch of the directions in SU3 place, SU3 space chosen by the medium strong interactions and chosen by the weak interaction. It just came out that way. That was Kabibo's idea. And being a bold man, he said exactly the same thing should be true for the axial vector currents. You have some octet of axial vector operators. They certainly aren't the con same angle. Some people try to vary it with different angles, but it's the same angle that turns out to fit experiment. So you have an octet 
they aren't the conserved currents, since there aren't any conserved axial vector currents. They're just some octet of operators. And you put things together with the same angle, certainly the most attractive hypothesis. Just a random guess. I mean, people looked at it. Shelley and I looked at it and said, what a random guess. What's the experimental evidence for that? <laughs> okay, but it's certainly an attractive guess, which Shelley and I didn't realize at the time. <laughs> we wrote a paper in which we said, well, what if it were minus sine theta here? We were bumped. This is a guess that gives us um, a lot of information about semi-leptonic hadron decays. There are a lot of these. The data books are full of them. I think there are nine or ten. Uh, baryons, baryon octet. How many unknown constants would we have in this matrix element? All of these decays proceed at relatively small momentum transfers, so we essentially have to know the various form factors of the vector and axial vector currents only at zero momentum transfer. The, uh, we have, of course, the Fermi constant, but we know that from mu on decay, so that's not a free parameter. So I'll put it in parentheses. We have the angle theta to be fixed. We have the matrix elements of the vector and axial vector currents, but we know that was a zero momentum transfer in the SU3 limit because they're SU3 conserved currents. And we have these axial vector currents, which I call currents at the moment just for laughs. They're just vector operators. They aren't associated with any conservation laws. So they can couple to the octet with some unknown d and some unknown f. Octet coupled to octet cross. Thus we have three unknown parameters in which we can fit all baryon non-leptonic decays. Oh, uh, sorry, semi-leptonic decays. That's a lot of decays, OK? We know, with no free parameters, the vector matrix element. And we can extract that by doing spin analysis. We know, in terms of two free parameters, the actual vector matrix. Sorry, in terms of one unknown parameter, the vector matrix elements. In terms of two more unknown parameters, the actual vector matrix elements. And it fits. It's the right theory. Again, this is a lightning summary. Just going to tell you that it's the right theory. Now, in the remainder of this lecture, which because of the heat is going to make you all feel happy, is going to run, and there's not a lecture scheduled for 3.30 or something like that. Is there in this day of many lectures? 4.30? Who's talking at 4.30? Oh, OK. I will run on for 10 minutes more because I want to get a, I, I want to, get to uh, a stopping point, a natural stopping point. So I now want to say something more about the various uh, semi-leptonic matrix elements. And uh, the matrix elements are the vector and axial vector hadronic currents, in, uh, in particular for the processes of nuclear beta decay and for the process of pion decay. Um, for the process of neutron decay, We want to study the matrix element between a proton state and a neutron state of fixed momentum of the hadronic current at a point x. Defining a momentum k as the momentum of the proton minus the momentum of the neutron. These are relativistically normalized states. We get e to the minus i k dot x, of course. And we get a bunch of stuff. I'll just write out the terms that survive at low momentum transfers. The only term that survives at really small momentum transfers from the vector current is the analog of an F1 form factor, which I'll call g, little g vector of k squared. There also is, of course, a sigma nu nu form factor and other stuff like that, but that's got powers of k in it. From the axial vector current, because of my v minus a definition, then there's some other junk, some of which I will write down in more detail in five minutes. 
These are the dominant elements in low um, in a low energy uh, neutron decay, where the momentum transfer is very small, a few MeV. The other terms are all killed by powers of K. GV and VA, GV of K squared, if we accept Feynman and Gelman, I'll just call GV at zero momentum transfer. That's the thing that's measured. If we accept Feynman and Gelman as modified by Kibibo, this should be cosine theta. The Kibibo angle is rather small. It's around 15 degrees. So to the order in which we're working, I'll just ignore strangeness changing um, uh, weak interactions and set cosine theta equal to 1. That makes a few percent error, but uh, we're not going to get any formulas accurate to a few percent in the remainder of this lecture. GA of 0 is measured. And its measured value will become significant to us. And that's at the last sheet, because I wrote that. It's 1.25 plus or minus 0.09. It's a measured number from studying neutron decay. <clears throat> the other process I want to consider is pion decay, the decay of a pi minus. The pi minus is a actual, um, where is it? Excuse me, that's page 6. I want to make sure all my conventions are right. The pi minus is a pseudoscalar particle. And it's very easy to see just by using parity that the vector current must have a vanishing matrix element between a pseudoscalar particle and the vacuum. Thus, only the axial vector current has a non-zero matrix element. For the matrix element, since there's only one vector in the problem, I put an I for convention. There must be the pi and momentum. That's the only vector around. I must have a factor of either I minus I p dot x. And the remainder is a number, which I will choose to call f pi over root 2. It doesn't depend on k squared because there's only one momentum transfer there. The root 2 is there to make subsequent equations look simple. f pi is a number that you measure from the pi and decay rate. It's known very well. We're going to connect it in a moment to this thing. The error in it is considerably less than the error in the ga of 0. So I just I wrote, copied it out without any error bars. It's 0.19 times the mass of the proton. This is just straight phenomenology. This is a statement that pi on beta decay occurs. The form of the thing is completely determined by parity and other constraints. There's got to be some number here. You measure the rate of beta decay and you find out what this number, pi on, you find out what this number is. Okay, it's actually from muon decay, which occurs with a considerably greater rate. <laughs> Now, here comes the deep field theoretic insight. I take the divergence of this equation. Pi minus. Well, divergence is pretty easy. Minus IP mu times plus IP mu is mass of the pi on squared. This means that the divergence of the axial vector current, a pseudoscalar field, has non-zero matrix elements between the one pion state and the vacuum. Of course, the form of the matrix element is completely determined by Lorentz invariance. The only th piece of information is that pi on, muon, pi on decay into muon and muon neutrino occurs. This process is, does not vanish, so the matrix element is non-zero. Now, remember last semester when we went around in circles about the reduction formula 
And we said one of the consequences of the reduction formula was that any local field was as good as any other local field for make computing S matrix elements. What it was doesn't matter as long as it has a non-zero amplitude for connecting the particle in question and the vacuum. Therefore, I will define the pi minus field, square root of 2 over m pi squared f pi d mu axial vector current. That is a definition. I do not say this is a canonical field. God forbid. Okay? But it is a perfectly legitimate local operator that will serve as a pion field. It may or may not be equal to the canonical pion field that appears in the Lagrangian of a theory with fundamental pions in it, if such a theory describes the world. I don't care. It is a legitimate local field, which as far as computing S matrix elements goes, is as good as any other possible candidate for the pi minus field. The square root of 2 is inserted here, by the way, so that when we go to isospin, uh, we complete the isotriplet, the square root of 2 will disappear with appropriate coefficients. But uh, we'll stick it in there for the moment. Now, now let's go back to the matrix. We know one thing about the matrix element of this object between proton and neutron because we do know whether the pion is a fundamental object or not, that it can connect a neutron to a proton. There is a strong interaction. That strong interaction, I'll factor out the pion pole. There's an I from a pion propagator and an I from the pion nucleon vertex. So that gives me minus 1. K squared minus m pi squared, u bar p i gamma 5 by my gamma 5 conventions, un times some form factor. If I chose a different candidate for the pi on field, I choose a different form factor. I get a different form factor. But one thing, and I'll put in a root 2 to take care of the root 2 convention in the pi on nucleon coupling constant. One thing I know for sure, absolutely for sure, and of course isn't either the minus i k dot x, one thing I know absolutely for sure, with no uh, pos whatever I choose it, the residue at the pi and pole is going to be the same. G of m pi squared will be the conventionally stride defined strong interaction coupling constant G. I'll be done in around two more minutes. And the experimental value of G is known. It is 13.5. Again, with a negligible error on the scale in which we are working. The best way of knowing measuring G is from the forward pi and nucleon dispersion relations and fitting it. And I explained those dispersion relations last lecture. Okay. Now, let's look a little bit more closely at just the axial vector matrix element between proton and neutron. I'll now write out all three possible invariants. There's u bar p. Then there'll be a bunch of other stuff, most of which will fit behind the door. And then n. There's gamma mu gamma 5 ga of k squared. That one we wrote down before. Then there's the analog axial vector. of the magnetic form factor for a normal particle that will turn out to disappear in the computation we're going to do. I'll call that g magnetic of k squared. And then there's one other form factor that appears in the axial current and not in the vector current because the axial current isn't necessarily conserved. And I define that to be minus k mu gamma 5 g p of k squared. UN. It's easy to see that all of these form factors have to be there. This is just the analog of the computation we did for the vector current with gamma 5 inserted. This is a thing that would be that contributes to the uh, four-dimensional longitudinal part of a mu. It's like a divergence of a scalar. 
the divergence gives out another k mu. Now, making a sensible kinematic approximation that MP equals MN, <clears throat> one can trivially compute the divergence of this thing. One gets P d mu a mu of x n. The k slashes and the gamma fives go together and make the usual routine. They hit the spinners on the right and the left. I won't bother to work that out. Everything survives u bar p i gamma 5 u n times twice the mass of the proton times g a of k squared plus k squared g p of k squared. This one is trivial, this one is trivial, this one is also trivial because uh, k mu k nu sigma mu nu is zero. Comparing this equation with this equation and the definition of 5 pi minus, we obtain a trivial looking equation. Root 2 over m pi squared, f pi. I'm sorry I'm running late, but I want to cover this material. And it's getting cooler anyway. <laughs> 2mp ga of k squared plus k squared gp of k squared equals minus 1 over k squared minus m pi squared root 2 g of k squared. I emphasize this equation is a total definition. It's absolutely free of any physical content whatsoever. It simply connects two ways of parameterizing the same matrix element, the matrix element of the divergence of the axial vector current. This equation is true, but it's also trivial. OK, does everyone understand that? You might not have followed the steps, but it's just a dumb sequence of operations. One is a direct parameterization of the matrix elements of the divergence of the current. The other is a parameterization of the matrix elements of the current in the natural way from which we compute the parameterization of the divergence. The Rattus are, of course, superfluous. They've been comfortably arranged to cancel. Now, we introduce physics into this equation following hypothesis. g of k squared is a function that is free of singularities except up to the 3 pi n threshold. We have extracted out the 1 pi n pole. Furthermore, even at the 3 pi n threshold, we don't expect, if our experience with electromagnetic form factors, are, of which this object is closely analogous, are any guide, we don't expect a lot of variation. The electromagnetic form factors which you can measure experimentally, don't have big changes at twice the mass of the pion squared. It's only when you get up to around the row mass that they have gigantic bumps in them. So to spec this equation to be, even if you just take the 3 pi n threshold, if you say something like the row mass or the omega mass or the mass of some axial vector meson is the thing to look at, you don't expect this thing to vary enormously over the region between k squared equals 0 and k squared equals m pi squared. You exp that's a nice region of analyticity. The threshold is up there at 9m pi squared. That threshold probably has a small residue, small discontinuity if the uh, electromagnetic form factors are a guide. 1m pi squared is a very small proportion of the distance to the nearest singularity. Therefore, I make the hypothesis based on exactly the same reasoning that went into the resonance analysis of the first part of this lecture. That in a region of analyticity, small compared to the distance to the nearest singularity and small compared to the characteristic lengths involved in the problem, I would expect okay, this 
this is a physical hypothesis, that this matrix element varies in the same way as every other matrix element we can measure. Not much over a distance of m pi squared once we've extracted out the pi on singularity. Does everyone agree this is a plausible hypothesis? The first part of next lecture, I will sp uh, spend half an hour explaining this hypothesis in seven different ways, actually only four, because it is so critical. But on this level, it's plausible. You swallow it? <laughs> OK, good. Now, therefore, evaluating the right-hand side of this equation at this point, we see the m pi squares cancel, minus 1 over 1. We find g equals, well, I'll write it in the form where I take out all the denominators, f pi times g equals 2 mass of the proton times ga. Evaluate at 0, this term vanishing at k squared equals 0. I've evaluated the equation at k squared equals 0 and made this hypothesis. is the famous, for one period notorious, but now famous, goldberger treeman relation. Please notice, the only thing that's going into this is kinematics that is completely free of any physical content and a single hypothesis about the rate of variation of g of 0. Okay. Now, the experimental situation. Notice it's a remarkable thing. It connects the pion decay constant, the strong interaction pion nucleon coupling constant, and the nucleon axial vector decay constant. Okay. Very strange. When it was first produced, it was extremely strange because in the old days, people said, ah, oh, nucleons are fundamental, maybe pions are bound states. They had learned about nucleons first, so they thought they were fundamental. And then they had a picture, well, pion decay is caused by nucleon decay. A pion comes along, becomes a nucleon-antinucleon pair, and they beta decay. That was their idea. Notice this high picture would lead to a relationship which was just the other way around. You connect f pi to the product of g at this vertex and ga at this vertex. Okay? Other way around. The G would be on the other side. Okay. Also, I emphasize that these things are of completely different order of magnitude. I mean, here's this enormous number, 13.5, sitting there. Okay, It's not that everything on the right-hand side and the left-hand side is of the same order of magnitude. If this works, feel right to be proud. Well, what is the answer? The right-hand side is 2.57 where I haven't paid any attention to possible error bars. Left-hand side, where I've only inserted the errors in GA, is 2.5. I guess I divide it by MP. I use units. Maybe 14, where are you now, Jimmy? I didn't have mass units on both sides. <coughs> this is, of course, 0.18, excuse me. Of course, it's an 0 0.19, 0.09 error in GS. I should say. This is by any, any excellent agreement with experiment. And notice the great simplicity of the ideas that go into it. And we will talk much more about this at the next lecture, which I hope will only take an hour and a half and not run, my God, 20 minutes over. <laughs>